registrations. There were no, no, okay. We are live. Just letting people in and then we can get going in just a minute. Okay. Why don't you get started, Liz, and we'll keep it moving. Okay. All right. Um, welcome to those of you online, and um, which is everybody. We'll get a few more in the from the waiting room um, as we uh, really get going here. A few housekeeping notes. Um, I am Liz Suffet, um, VP of Adult Education and Programs at Congregation Beth Emick. Um, I'm very excited for this. I'm very happy that you're all here. I do want to note that the chat box has been disabled, but please put um, any questions you have, type them into the Q&A section, which you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, and we will relay them at the end of the presentation. Um, if you submitted questions um, in advance, which I believe a few people did, um, would you please mind repeating those in the Q&A, um, add those in as well, because I don't I personally don't have access to them. So um, again, I'm Liz Suffet from Congregation Beth Emick. This program is being co-sponsored by CCJCC. Um, very uh, happy and thankful for that. I wanna introduce our speaker. Um, John F. Rothman is our speaker tonight. He's on the faculty of the Fromm Institute at the University of San Francisco. He is a longtime, very experienced politics and foreign policy consultant specializing with the US, the Mideast, and the former USSR and whatever form that's taking these days. Um, he is a frequent lecturer on American politics and the presidency. He has spoken at over 150 college campuses around the world. Uh, John has authored two books and has also published a wide range of articles on American political history, the Mideast and education, and evidently has a phenomenal library. Um, you may have heard his radio talk show on KGO. He now hosts a podcast, uh, a daily podcast around the political world with John Rothman. It's available on Apple and Google Play. Um, if you uh, want to connect with him there, um, I do a secondary um, uh, introduction to Alon Kama, who has some personal notes of welcome and um, uh, for for John and you. Thank you, Liz. Um, so yeah, just wanted to share my experience. I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting John over 25 years ago. I was an undergrad at UC Berkeley. And um, 
at the time, it was the mid nineties, uh, campus um, feeling and, and kind of the uh, pro and anti-Israel um, sense on campus was pretty similar to what is going on today. Um, John was very important in working with us through the Hillel and the Israel Action Committee that I was involved in at the time to help us uh, through this. Uh, some people really did, wanted more information. They did not understand the full context. Some wanted to uh, defend Israel and defend uh, their values, but were really lacking a lot of the knowledge and the context of uh, the history. And uh, John was really instrumental in getting us uh, organized on this and speaking confidently um, about our values on campus. So I want to thank John for that. And I'm hoping he can uh, provide the same service to us in this congregation, in this community, in these challenging times as well. So that we're educated on what's going on. We understand uh, what is right and that we can get our questions answered in, uh, with a very knowledgeable host here. So thank you, John, and welcome. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you and to all of my dear friends who are listening, uh, those who I've known for many years, I'm particularly glad to be with you. And Judy Coy, if you're listening, I was thrilled to receive your message, uh, an old friend of my family. Well, let me begin by saying that this is a rather somber time. Those of you who listen to the news this evening know that the situation in Israel is, is very difficult. We rejoiced at the release of some hostages. Not all hostages and not all women were released. Uh, we still have over 130 hostages. And frankly, if you've been following the news today, you know that many of the hostages who were released, who identified what happened to them in captivity, well, finally, there is a recognition of that rape was a method used by Hamas in the horrific actions of which uh, were committed on October 7th. I want to try to break this down into several parts, and I'm really looking forward to all of your questions. Let me begin by saying that a lot of people wonder why we care so much. And I'm reminded that the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, on the eve of the Six-Day War, was asked by a well-meaning Christian friend, why do you care so much? And Heschel, who was a very gentle man, said, imagine that I hold in my hand the last copy of the Bible in existence, and it's about to be thrust into the flames. That is the way many of us feel right now as Israel goes through the agony of this war. Let me tell you that I'm going to break this down into several things. First, what's going on in Israel. I want to talk about what's happening in terms of American politics, and I want to talk about what's happening on the campuses. I'll try to limit myself and take all the questions that you can possibly throw at me. The Israel we knew before October 7th is gone. It is a new Israel. It is in Israel that was in the midst of a great crisis in advance of what happened on October 7th. You all know there were demonstrations repeatedly on the uh, judicial reform bill and much more. Well, we now know that Israel has come together. Uh, there is a national unity cabinet. It is made up of members of the opposition and that the people of Israel are resolved to get through this crisis. Uh, what does it mean in terms of the future of Israel? Well, look, let's give you a little quick history lesson. Gaza was not new to this crisis. You understand that in 1956, Israel had a war, the Sinai War, and Israel took Gaza. And in the end, uh, Israel withdrew from Gaza, a very famous speech by Golda Meir on March the 1st, 1957, in which she said, we are withdrawing, but we want guarantees. And Israel was given guarantees. There would be demilitarization. And of course, Egypt in 1967, on the eve of the Six Day War, proceeded to once again attack Israel. And Israel was able in that activity to eliminate the Egyptians from Gaza and took over Gaza. And look, I spent many happy hours in Gaza, in Gaza City, in Khan Yunus, uh, throughout the Strip. Uh, and what I remember most vividly was Israel's willingness to give for peace. And this is very important. Uh, when Arik Sharon, about whom we used to say affectionately, he was like 
a bull who carried with him his own china shop, Arik Sharon announced the unilateral withdrawal of Israel from Gaza. All Jewish settlements were withdrawn. All Jewish settlers were withdrawn. And the idea was that Gaza would become a prototype of peace. A Sharon indicated that if everything went well in Gaza, if the Gaza Strip could become the Riviera of the Middle East, there would be compromises in terms of the West Bank as well. Well, you all know what happened. Uh, the Israelis left even the hothouses uh, for flower growing, and they were destroyed by the radicals who now control the Gaza Strip. You know that when Israel withdrew, the Palestinian Authority was put in charge. And some of you will remember the absolutely horrific moment when Hamas not only won the election, they won the election in Gaza, a free election, a democratic election, but they proceeded to take members of the Palestinian Authority and hurl them off rooftops. You can Google it, you can see it. And so Hamas took over in Gaza. Now, some of you have read the Hamas Charter. I want you all to understand that Article 7 of the Hamas Charter says this. It quotes from the Haditha. If a Jew, not an Israeli, but a Jew, if a Jew should hide behind a rock or a tree, let the rock or the tree cry out, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. We understand what Hamas is. And we understand that their war is not just against Israelis. It's against Jews. I say this with some deep sadness. I want you to know that there was a ceasefire that Israel observed. It was Hamas which broke the ceasefire on October the 7th. And all the promises that had been made about peace with Gaza, and indeed, look what happened in the south when the uh, fence was breached and Hamas came in. The kibbutzim uh, along the border were primarily made up of people on the left, people who wanted peace. And yet we know that on October 7th, we saw a brutality unparalleled, more Jews killed on one day than at any day since the Holocaust. And the tragedy of it all was the innocence, the women, the children, the horrific murders which took place. Now, I want you to understand very clearly, when Israel is at war now, it is against Hamas. It is not against the Palestinian people. What we know about Hamas is that they used the Palestinian people as shields. They built their, their centers, uh, their operational headquarters in the middle of civilian areas, including under hospitals. And we've now established that as a fact. And so Israel is caught on the horns of a great dilemma. And I want you all to understand I do not say this with any joy. I always remember what Golda Meir said. Golda Meir once said, we can forgive them for killing our sons. We will never forgive them for making us kill their sons. And now we know it's not just sons, it's daughters. One of the things that was so stunning to all of us was the silence that emanated from the United Nations. No surprise, really. But neither the General Assembly nor the Security Council have, have of, as of this moment, have condemned Hamas for the atrocities committed on October 7th. I want to say a word about Israel's actions. I do not know another nation that would give a 72-hour warning that they were going to hit back. And that's what Israel did, a 72-hour warning. Now, I have to tell you, one of the great tragedies in this ongoing struggle is what has happened to the Palestinian people. And no one, no one likes to see what we are seeing now on our televisions. But I want to again remind you, this was the fault of Hamas. We know there was a failure in intelligence, don't we? Now, you remember 50 years ago, when I came over to your neck of the woods and talked about the Yom Kippur War, we knew there was a failure of intelligence in that situation. 
a Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan, played the, paid the ultimate price in having to resign from power. There was a similar intelligence failure in this war. We now know that the operational plans were in Israel's hands about a year ago. The problem was that Israel did not believe that Hamas could mount the kind of attack that it did. I am reminded that in our tradition, we are told, if they say they're going to come and kill you, believe them. Israel, out of hubris, arrogance, who knows? There was an intelligence failure. And yes, there will be an investigation. That investigation most certainly will result in changes in the government. There are many who ask the question, can't we have a Palestinian state? And particularly when we talk about the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, as the Israelis call it. And I want to be crystal clear about this as well. If you consider the geography and you understand that Israel at its narrowest prior to 1967 was nine miles wide. <laughs> I must tell you, I know people who jog nine miles every day. Now, I am not one of them. Do you understand that if the Palestinian Authority, which is a very weak operation, very corrupt operation, were to take over in the West Bank, they would most certainly be overthrown by Hamas. One of the most interesting results of this war has been the fact that although there are people who are on the left, people who are on the right, there are many who have believed strongly in a two-state solution. There is a recognition that at this point, a two-state solution is not doable. The fear that if a Palestinian state were created, that Hamas would do precisely on the West Bank what they did in Gaza is a real fear. Those of you who have been to Israel and you've been to Kalkilia and other areas on the West Bank, you understand the geography dictates against a Palestinian state unless there were real, genuine peace. You know how this can all end? All Hamas has to do is give up control, release the hostages. I, I have to tell you what really upset me in, in these last few weeks. I reflected on Eric Hoffer. Many of you remember Eric Hoffer is the great writer, philosopher. He lived here in San Francisco. He was a longshoreman, and I knew him pretty well. And he once observed that the problem of the world is they expect the Jews to be the only real Christians in the world. What Hamas is is an existential threat to the survival of Israel. And I want to guarantee you right here and now, Israel will not put themselves in a position of an existential threat. Let me talk about the relationship with the United States of America. Uh, Joe Biden has been a great friend of Israel. I've known Joe Biden uh, since the late 1970s. Some of you remember former Congressman Tom Lantos. Before Tom was in Congress, uh, he was an economic advisor on the staff of Joe Biden. And whenever I was in Washington, I'd go by Joe Biden's office and I would see Tom and, and Senator Biden would come in as well. Biden has always been a great friend of Israel. No one should ever doubt that for a moment. Uh, and I, I think his statement on October 7th was so reassuring to the Israeli people. But America is under a lot of pressure. And we have to recognize that there are people on the left and on the right uh, that really represent opponents of Israel, no question about it. Uh, let me say a quick word about the progressive left. I listened to Congresswoman Jayapal, who leads the Progressive Caucus, who today could not bring herself to condemn rape as a method of war by Hamas. It was a stunning moment, absolutely shocking. But I want to also tell you that we have the same problem on the right. And all of you who are familiar with former Congressman Pete McCloskey and, and others on the right of the Republican Party or Pat Buchanan know that they too were critical of Israel. One of the things we have learned is the extremes of left and right come together in their criticism of Israel. I must tell you, I think we are very fortunate to have a president of the United States who is so committed to Israel and its survival. I just said a word that I'm sorry I had to use. The word is survival. But I want to make crystal clear, with the Houthis 
firing off missiles, which are, frankly, uh, the equivalent of piracy now in the Red Sea. Uh, if you understand what is going on in Lebanon uh, and the real fear that Israel has, uh, that uh, Nasrallah and Hezbollah, uh, Nasrallah is their head, they have 150,000 rockets. And let me tell you, if they start firing those rockets, Iron Dome will not protect Israel or Tel Aviv or Haifa or any of the north of the country. Uh, it is because of American pressure and the stationing of two battle carrier divisions, the Eisenhower and the Ford are both in the Middle East that I think have been primarily responsible for the restraint uh, of Nasrallah. His primary concern is not the destruction of Israel, but his own survival. Uh, Iran. Iran is no doubt the culprit in all of this. There can be no doubt that Iran is now responsible for attacks on American installations in the Middle East. And there is no doubt that Iran still desires the destruction of Israel. Uh, thank God, Iran does not have a nuclear capability. And I must tell you, that is something that we will have to tackle in the future. Uh, I want to say a word about uh, uh, the whole question of the future of Israel in the Middle East. The Abraham Accords by Donald Trump, uh, and I have to tell you, I'm a great critic of Donald Trump. Those of you who listen to me in my podcast or heard me on KGO know I have very few nice things to say about Donald Trump. But the Abraham Accords was a major accomplishment for which he deserves credit as does his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Uh, these were uh, David Friedman, former American ambassador to Israel. Great achievement. And the effort, frankly, to have some sort of cooperation with Saudi Arabia uh, is very important. You know the old expression, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, we have a friend, the Saudis. Now, some of you will say, but they're, they're barbarians. And the answer is, they may be barbarians, but they are our barbarians. And the fact is that you now have a split in the Muslim world between the Sunnis and the Shias. And we have to be very mindful of that. I want to say a word about the implications in the United States of America uh, for this crisis. <laughs> Jews in America, for the first time, in a direct way, are feeling Jew hatred. I want to be careful about this. I'm not calling it anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a euphemism for Jew hatred. And I don't know about you, but I feel it. I know it. Uh, whether you're on Mercer Island up in, in Washington, where the synagogue there was desecrated with Jew-hating expressions, whether you are in any area in this country now, the police are monitoring Jewish community centers, synagogues, um, because there is a real fear of that kind of irrationality. Uh, Jew hatred is on the rise, and we need to recognize that. Uh, the campuses are particularly difficult. Uh, years ago, when my older son Samuel, who served in the IDF, by the way, my older son Samuel was a little boy, I took him to rallies. I used to go to the pro-Palestinian rallies intentionally. I still do. And uh, the chant was being conveyed, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And Samuel, who was probably 10 or 11 years old, looked at me and said, well, what does that mean, Daddy? And I said, the river is the Jordan River. The sea is the Mediterranean Sea. And what's in the middle? I asked him. And he said, Israel. And I said, what does that mean? He said, there's no room for Israel. And that's exactly right. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is an expression which calls for the elimination of Israel. And as we now know, sadly, Jews in general. I think that may be the most shocking event that comes out of this war. The feeling that Jews have that they are not safe in their own homes. So I wanted to raise that with you. I don't have an answer. I want you to be aware of that. Uh, I do believe that we have an obligation to do more on campuses. Uh, for a long time, we did, and then we stopped, basically. 
And we have not given our students on college campuses the tools to do what has to be done. Maybe some of you saw 60 Minutes last night. They did their first segment on the crises on campuses in America. And they used, as, <clears throat> excuse me, as an example, they used as an example uh, what's going on at Columbia University and also what happened at Dartmouth. And so they wanted to show the difference between a, a big campus and a small campus. When you live in a country, a free country, where we have had no fear, not in years, when people tell their children, take off your stars of David, take off your yarmulkes, we have to pause and ask, what in the world is going on? And I say this very respectfully, but with great clarity. And I want to tell you that in my judgment, we were as surprised by this rise in Jew hatred as Israel was by the attack which took place on October 7th. What I learned in all of this is that we need to be eternally vigilant. We need to understand that this is not a transient problem. This is a problem that is growing and one which we have to address. I want to say a quick word about what's happening in city councils and boards of supervisors here in the state of California and around the nation. You all saw what happened in Oakland. You saw what happened in Hayward. Tomorrow, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors will encounter the same sorts of demonstrations. I monitor these things. I listen carefully to these things. And it's scary. Make no mistake. The hatred that is expressed is real, and it cuts like a knife through those of us who have wanted to believe that all will be well. Well, we now know that isn't the case. We have to fight to preserve the liberty that we have. Uh, I can't begin to tell you that even in small towns where I've spoken in recent days, police protection is required at synagogues and Jewish community centers. And that, to me, is disturbing. Let me, I know that many of you have questions. I know you want to ask them, and I, I want to answer them. But let me just express to you this feeling. I am fully confident in the future of Israel. I am fully confident that Israel will, in the end, achieve what it must achieve for its own security. I feel with equal passion that Jews who live outside of Israel, whether in the United States or in Europe, and by the way, I didn't even mention what's going on in France or in Great Britain or, or in many European capitals. It, it's scary. It's horrifying. Uh, I have full faith that we will get beyond this. One thing that I am certain of, we must have the internal fortitude and we must have the allies around us who are willing to stand with us. Just so you understand this, one of the most distressing things about this war and these trying times is the deafening silence we hear from many who have been our traditional allies. Um, it simply reinforces a basic concept, and that is that in the end, the Jewish people can have friends and allies, but in the end, what matters is what we do ourselves. And I say that with a full sense and measure of what that means. I have every confidence. I've never put my head down because I'm a Jew. I've never apologized for being a Zionist, which I am and continue to be. I believe that Israel, Israel makes a difference in all of our lives. Those of us who are old enough know that living in a world without an Israel is very different than living in a world with an Israel. And I'm very grateful for the fact that Israel exists, that Israel is strong. And let me just conclude by saying Israel is not a perfect nation. There are things which may happen in the next few days, weeks, months, which will cause many of us to ask why. And the answer is because when you are threatened with your very survival, you have no choice but to respond. 
It is not a pleasant aspect. War is hell. And those of you who've experienced conflict understand that. But I guarantee you this. Israel will continue to protect itself, continue to speak out for the rights of Jews around the world. And that, of course, is what Israel was intended to do. So that's my quick summary. I wanted to keep it short because I want to make sure you can ask me any question you want. I will try to answer as quickly and as effectively as I can. And so fire away. Sounds good. Thank you, John, for that. Um, I personally have many questions to ask you, but first I'll uh, yield to our community. Uh, Rina asks, what can we do about the pro-Palestinian resolutions passed by so many city councils? The only thing you can do is vote. And you have to let your city council members know how you feel. Uh, they are under conflicting pressure. Remember that. But we have to be resolute in our statements. And I must tell you, the way I watch the Hayward City Council, the Oakland City Council, and yes, some of the things I've seen here in San Francisco, it's really appalling. And uh, we, we simply have to resolutely use the political levers uh, that we have, including uh, running candidates for political office, including demanding that people stand up. Look, let me give you an example. In Oakland, Dan Kalb, I've known Dan for a million years, a member of the Oakland City Council. He resolutely tried to get the Oakland City Council resolution to include a condemnation of Hamas. Who could not condemn Hamas for what it did on October 7th? He couldn't get that part of his amendment to the resolution passed. Uh, that's very revealing. But we have to seek out our friends. We have to encourage our friends. We have to work as a community. Uh, I know that uh, we have to be in touch with members of Congress, but also with members of city councils. And we should not, for even an instant, uh, permit resolutions to pass if we can do anything to stop them, which do not condemn Hamas for what it did on October 7th, and what it continues to do, you know, there was just an attack in Jerusalem the other day. Uh, so we have to be let them know. And one, one last point on this. <clears throat> if I am uncomfortable, I want members of city councils to be uncomfortable. If I have concerns, I want them to understand those concerns. I am a constituent too. Next question. Next question comes from Jim. Uh, he is also a proud alumni of Cal Berkeley. I'm a supporter of the Cal Center for Jewish Studies in Hillel. What else do you suggest I do for Cal? Uh, I have to tell you, uh, I am fully in favor of alumni of the uh, Hillel program, supporting Hillel, giving Jewish students the tools that they need. They need to have the appropriate resources from the community. Are the Israel Action Centers on campuses really working? Do they have speakers coming to their campuses? Uh, you have to ask the students what they need, and then the community has to respond. The other thing that I feel very strongly about is affording students uh, the opportunity to go to Israel and see for themselves. Uh, that to me is critical, and uh, many of you will remember when you were in college, that was one of the things we promoted, going to Israel to see, to experience. But find out what they need and give them the tools to do the job. Absolutely. Arthur um, asks, one of the reasons the atmosphere at Dartmouth did not become explosive after October 7th was that there was a good relationship between the Jewish studies faculty and Middle East studies. What is the relationship between Jewish studies faculty and Middle East faculty at USF? At USF, uh, there had been no incidents. I'll be speaking tomorrow. Uh, on the campus uh, and uh, look, every campus is different. Uh, if you're familiar friends with UC Davis or, or UC Berkeley or San Francisco State University, uh, this is not a new problem. This is a constant problem. You know, I remember when President Corrigan, the former president of SF State University uh, 20 years ago said that SF State was the most anti-Jewish campus in America. Do you remember that? And he was an Irish Catholic out of Hell's Kitchen. Uh, one of the things about this war is it has radicalized uh, everybody. 
Uh, but for Jewish students, it's particularly difficult uh, because, unfortunately, uh, they really have no one to help them. Uh, once upon a time, there was something called the University Service Department of the American Zionist Youth Foundation. I was the chairman of the student committee for over 20 years. That, regrettably, fell by the wayside. People didn't see a need for effective uh, information on campus. Uh, it's one of the great mistakes that the Jewish community in this country made. But what do we do? We have to build those bridges. We have to do what we can. We have to encourage students to reach out. And that applies to Jewish faculty, pro-Israel faculty. Uh, and a lot of them are worried about their own careers, and they tend to step back a bit. But we have to encourage them to step forward and do what we can to help the students. And this is this is not just a Northern California problem. This is a problem across America and Canada and Europe. Anyway. Absolutely. I wish I, wish I had a magic wand. I, I really do. Uh, I spent, uh, some of you know, uh, 30 years just traveling college campuses talking about Israel. I never charged a fee for it. I did it as part of my own feeling of responsibility. And as you pointed out in your introduction, uh, Things have not really changed, but when you're in a war, there's an exaggeration. And I also want to point one other thing out to you. Uh, look, when Israel has a triumph, like the Six-Day War, there's this tremendous feeling of support uh, because we're proud. But when Israel encounters the kinds of difficulties which they face at this very moment, it's a lot harder to stand up because people are reluctant to defend a situation in which innocent people, and I'm talking about Palestinians, are dying. Uh, and what I try to point out to people is nobody is rejoicing at that. The Israelis are not rejoicing at that. Uh, they're very upset about it. Uh, I talked recently with some of the soldiers in Gaza. Uh, they're, they're absolutely beside themselves. But why is it happening? It's happening because what has Hamas said? Well, they have said as soon as they can mount another attack of equal force to October the 7th, they're going to do it. So what's what's the alternative? I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not by nature somebody who, who applauds war. I'm not. Uh, but I don't know, what would you do? What do you do? I have a son who served in the Israeli army. And what would I do if my child were kidnapped? H have you listened to the anguish of the hostage families. I mean, this is, I go to bed at night and I cry because I feel as if there's nothing we can really do. The only thing we can do is support Israel, support the students on campuses here, be active in our communities, make sure our public officials stand four square with us. Uh, that's what we have to do. And that's what we're going to do. And it doesn't mean that every time we do it, we're going to feel we were successful. There are many times when we won't feel successful, but nonetheless, we have to do it. It's our responsibility. We, you know, we're a blessed generation. We live, we live in a world within Israel. Can you imagine what it was like? Uh, one other quick point. I, I just have to say this. I listened carefully to the Palestinians in this country who talk about 75 years of occupation. They're talking about 1948. They're not talking about an occupation uh, since 1967. They're talking about Israel as a nation that is an occupying force in the land of Israel. And we better understand the face of the enemy. I said it before. If a Jew should hide behind a rock or a tree, let the rock or the tree cry out, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. Do you understand? They're talking about you, and they're talking about me. Next question we had. Uh, please comment on the silence of women organizations in general and the National Council of Jewish Women regarding the horrific rapes during October 7th. I don't understand it. I told you I listened to uh, Congresswoman Jayapal today. Uh, who was unwilling to uh, denounce rape, I, 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 I have to tell you, it is shocking to me. It, it, it's appalling to me. 
uh, the silence of women's groups and so-called progressive groups. And by the way, uh, I am a liberal Democrat, okay? I'm not a reactionary Republican. I'm somebody who, who has ripped on Donald Trump on more than one occasion and will do so again. But I have to confess to you my deep anguish at the silence of people on the left. Maybe they're afraid of not being politically correct. Well, hell, I've never given a tinker's damn about being politically correct. I want to do the right thing. And uh, so my attitude is, if women's groups who are involved in these kinds of issues can't speak out for Israeli women because they're Jews, there's something wrong with them, not with us. Similar question to the lack of uh, support. What is your opinion of evangelicals, uh, fundamentalist Christians? We have heard their voice before. What about hey, now? Well, let me answer the question. People used to ask me what I thought about Jerry Falwell, who called himself a Zionist. And they said, uh, what do you think about going to bed with Jerry Falwell? And I said, the question is not whether we go to bed with him. The question is, how far do we go? The Christian evangelicals are great friends of Israel. Not for the same reason that we would want. And some of you who live in the East Bay will remember the California Christian Committee for Israel, which was run by Mary Rose Black of blessed memory, and Inez Clay Loudermilk, whose husband was the great agronomist and friend of Israel. Uh, I'm, I am willing to work with people on the left, people on the right. This is not a partisan issue. This is a question of the survival of the Jewish people, the survival of Israel as a nation and doing the right thing. So I, I don't want to be politically incorrect, and I think the correct thing to do is to stand up for Israel and to stand up for Jews. And people who don't reveal their weakness or their true colors, uh, and I think we have to be very cognizant of that. There's a new a new movie out about my old friend Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was the, uh, he was a homosexual. Uh, he was a uh, uh, the man who organized the Civil Rights March in Washington in 1963. Uh, many of you will recall I hosted him here in San Francisco many times. He and I uh, not only collected walking sticks together, but uh, we had a just a wonderful rapport. Bayard Rustin, when the Zionism as Racism Resolution was passed in 1975 by the United Nations, wrote an article saying why I am a Zionist. He was a great Zionist. He was a social democrat. Uh, he was a progressive, and I regret to say there are not a lot of people like him uh, still around, and that's too bad. But we have to continue to work to build those kinds of coalitions. So my my answer is we have to keep at it. The same thing applies within the ranks of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Uh, and uh, fortunately, we have allies in both. Let me quickly just point this out. <clears throat> a lot of people... Uh, talk to me about the left wing of the Democratic Party and uh, they're being anti-Israel. Well, all of you can remember, I hope, when we had a group within the Republican Party, uh, Pete McCloskey, uh, Paul Findlay, and yes, Pat Buchanan, who were just as vicious on the right as those on the left were. But I always look positively at our friends and one of the things we learned in this crisis is that the left and the right, whatever criticisms they have, have come together in terms of support for Israel, overwhelmingly. And uh, that's what we have to continue to work uh, to achieve. So what do you think things will be like a year from today? Or yeah. even is there an end game after the war ends, which assuming it, it will uh, what are some uh, outcomes and what is some creative thinking around how to uh, move on from this? Okay, the first thing is it's not Israel that is responsible for what happens at the end. It's the Palestinians themselves. Somebody asked me about the devastation in Gaza. So let me answer you bluntly. Uh, we bombed Dresden during the Second World War. Uh, we bombed them back to the Stone Ages, as Curtis LeMay would have said. And we dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And yet our belief was that out of the ashes would rise a democracy. And that's what happened in Germany. In Germany, they had Konrad Adenauer, the former mayor of Cologne, 
who led a West German government and allowed for democracy to thrive in Germany. And in Japan, uh, and I have to say we owe Emperor Hirohito a great debt. Uh, when the decision was made to keep him on the throne, the decision was also made to work with the Japanese to rebuild uh, Japan. And Japan is now a vibrant, vital democracy. The best we can hope is that with the devastation that comes out of this war, that a new generation of Palestinian leaders will arise, uh, as they did in Germany and Japan, who will want to work for peace. Now, let me tell you, what I've just said to you is completely unrealistic, okay? Let me shatter the illusion. Because one of the things we know out of this war is there will be great bitterness, and it's going to take Israel a long time to repair that. This war was good for nobody and only creates... Uh, much more difficult dynamic. Uh, let me just say a quick word about Israel itself. Um, and I'm going to prognosticate a little bit, and I hope you don't mind my doing so. Uh, I think Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, time as prime minister is coming to an end. Uh, I think he will suffer the same fet fate as Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan because of the war and the issues surrounding the war. There will be a new generation of Israeli leaders. Uh, and that generation of Israeli leaders will have a huge task. Do you understand faith has been shattered? Talk to your friends on the left in Israel, and you will hear that absolutely. Uh, very good friends of mine who've always been on the left, supporting a two-state solution, doing the whole nine yards, have given up. It will take time to rebuild trust. And the Palestinians really have a burden. They have to prove their willingness. Do you remember the Oslo process? I remember the Oslo process. And I remember the questions that were posed to me everywhere. Do you support the Oslo process? And I, I took a very strong stand in favor of Oslo. Not because I thought the process would, would work in the end, and of course it didn't, but because the alternative was a disaster. Do you know, do you all remember why Arafat signed an agreement with Rabin in Paris? Do you remember? Because Arafat was afraid of Hamas that was gaining strength. And Arafat thought he could diffuse the growing strength of Hamas. And of course it failed. And the Palestinian Authority has failed. Mahmoud Abbas, who by the way is a Holocaust denier, whose term as president expired 20 years ago, there haven't been new elections. Do you know why there have not been new elections in the Palestinian Authority? The reason is because Hamas would win. And let me tell you, that's what really shakes the Israelis. Can you imagine a Palestinian state on the West Bank ruled by Hamas? Do you know what that would mean if you lived in Tel Aviv? Disaster. So these are all issues that will have to be left to the future. One thing I am certain of, the United States is Israel's best friend. There may be ups and downs in the relationship, but Democrats and Republicans alike are united in support of Israel. I don't agree with some of the people, uh, particularly in the Republican Party, and what motivates them. But just as I said before, the question is not whether we go to bed with them. The question is how far do we go once we're in bed? And their support is critical. And American support is critical. Uh, thank God the United States of America uh, continues to support Israel. And for those who are critical of Joe Biden or Donald Trump, remember both Trump and Biden have been very pro-Israel. And that's very important as well. Because America is critical in the Middle East. We are the only power of which can make a difference. And that's why when people ask me about a deal with Saudi Arabia, and I'm no friend of, of the Saudis, uh, I've, I've seen their corruption and their, uh, well, the incredible problems, particularly with the Wahhabis. Uh, if a deal can be struck, it needs to be struck. Can it be struck now? I don't know. And by the way, don't, don't rule out the question of Iran. Remember, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Remember that, because it's going to be critical in the days ahead. Uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't love Israel, but they fear Iran. And the whole world should fear Iran. Uh, and uh, the radical Islamic 
the terror which has emanated from Iran. Hamas could not do what it's doing. Uh, Nasrallah and Hezbollah in Lebanon could not do what they are doing. Uh, Islamic Jihad could not function without that. And let me tell you, Lebanon is, is a mess. You know, Lebanon doesn't have a president. They, they, they can't even elect a national government. Uh, and so Lebanon is a, is a real conundrum as well. Anyway, I, I, I can give you in-depth on everything I've just said, but there are a lot of concerns, a lot of issues. Uh, next question. Well, a couple of related questions to that then. Back to the United States. Um, our military has been attacked quite a few times uh, on its bases in the Middle East. When will we respond? Uh, the answer is we are responding. Uh, that is the whole point of the actions which we have taken. Now, here's a question for all of you. And I, I want you to imagine if you're president of the United States, you see Iran is an existential threat, not only to Israel, but to Saudi Arabia. Uh, do we go to war against Iran? No. No, there's no way that will happen. And I think one of the things that uh, we are learning is containment is going to be the key. Uh, and that is what the United States is trying to do now. I know there'll be criticism of the Biden administration or the uh, Trump administration over various actions, but we have to try. Uh, I am very concerned about Iran. And many of you know that I took a very unpopular position opposing the Iranian nuclear deal because I knew the Iranians would never keep it. You know, it's just that simple. We knew that Iran would not keep the deal. And, uh, well, it's a problem. And Joe Biden, who supported the deal, I think now understands that more completely. Sometimes you have to go through these things to understand it. I'll combine several questions. There's several um, points about the presumptive uh, presidential candidates on both sure. the Democratic and the Republican side, Nikki Haley, Donald Trump, and uh, Joe Biden. Their responses and their support of Israel, if you care to compare contrast. I am not here as a partisan. I want to be very clear about that. I want to try to give you what I've always done, off the bark, my objective analysis. Donald Trump is a disaster on every level. And I think that I agree with Liz Cheney. His return to the White House would be an unmitigated disaster. And I'm not talking about Israel. I'm just talking about in general. And some of you will disagree with me. It's fine. I give him high marks for the uh, Abraham Accords. But I want to be clear, I work for Richard Nixon, as many of you know. Don't worry, I go to shul every Yom Kippur. I do an extra al hate. I fast an extra hour. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm very cognizant of that. But when you have a, a president uh, saying what Donald Trump is saying about the Constitution, putting it aside, uh, when you have a president of the United States who talks about creating an enemies list or weaponizing the Justice Department, that crosses a line. Uh, Nikki Haley, who is seems to be up and coming, is very pro-Israel great record on uh, during her tenure at the United Nations, but uh, she's very far to the right politically. If you're pro-choice, you can't vote for Nikki Haley. Uh, if you are um, a moderate Republican, you're not comfortable with it. Uh, DeSantis, I don't have much faith in at all. His whole policy on book banning and so forth is to me appalling. And I listened to the so-called debate between Newsom and DeSantis, and those of you who took the time to listen to it, it wasn't a debate. It was not a debate. It was uh, horrific, bad for both of them. Uh, the question that is posed now is what if Joe Biden, for some reason, is not a candidate uh, for re-election, although he says he is and he's running as if he is, but he's 81 years old and anything can happen. The odds on favorite is Kamala Harris. Uh, I did the first radio talk show interview with her. I've known her for many years. Uh, no one knows what a vice president will do until they're president. I just want to make that clear. Remember Harry Truman? They used to say about Truman, to air is Truman. Uh, they also said he was the senator from Pendergast, who was the political boss of Missouri. So you have to wait and see. There are Democrats waiting in the wings, of course, including Gavin Newsom, including Governor Whitmer of Michigan, uh, including Amy Klobuchar, a senator from Minnesota. Uh, and uh, the Democratic Party does not have a uh, a lack of potential candidates. Uh, so all of the candidates for president, and I want to emphasize this, 
Democrat and Republican, all of them are pro-Israel. The Democratic Party, absolutely solid. The Republican Party, absolutely solid, although there will be various people within their ranks who may not be. But uh, I, I'm fully aware of the work we have to do, whether you volunteer in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, to make sure of that kind of uh, continuing support. But we've done that for years and years and years. Those of you <laughs> who are active in APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, know that Cy Kennan, who was the founder of APAC and who was a good friend of mine, always said the key was to have good relationships with your local representatives. By the way, that includes people on city councils uh, and uh, in the state legislature. If you have good relationships with those people, then when push comes to shove, you can make a difference. Uh, I always point out, I knew Richard Nixon very well, and I believe I had a very positive influence on Richard Nixon uh, in the mid-1960s when it came to Israel. So uh, these are all things you have to take into account. Next. Next. Um, how do you feel the public um, affairs uh, machine or the PR campaign from Israel is working this time. Historically, it's been pretty poor getting the message out. Yeah, but that's in Hebrew, the term is Hasbara, <laughs> the question of Hasbara. And let me tell you, Israel has never been good on Hasbara. <laughs> uh, some of you will remember when you were in college, the intense criticism on the question of Hasbara. Uh, I think our job locally is to interpret as much as we can in the best way we can. I regret there is no longer a uh, KGO radio because I have the opportunity every night to speak to millions of people. Uh, our newspapers are not particularly effective. There, by the way, there's no talk radio left in Northern California, local talk radio. Uh, newspapers, very limited, whether you're dealing with the Tribune or the B or the Chronicle. Um, but we have to do the best we can. One of the things I try to do is I speak to as many groups as I can interfaith groups, uh, Jewish groups, it doesn't matter. Uh, and we have to develop that core of people who will go out and, and spread the word. I regret to say that uh, we're not organized in that way as we once were. We have to do it again. We have to recreate it. And particularly if you live in small communities, uh, and most of you listening to the sound of my voice at this moment live in a small community or communities, Get to know your elected public officials. Uh, do the work you have to do. Make sure that your local Hillel's or community college uh, organizations have the support that they need. Uh, it's the best advice that I can give uh, because uh, winning the PR war is going to be important. And by the way, what happened last night on 60 Minutes uh, when they were contrasting Columbia and Dartmouth was very constructive. Uh, I, I don't agree with all the points that were made, but on balance, people have to understand it is a real problem. Uh, and I don't know if it, it's affecting you and your community in terms of your community relations, but uh, certainly if you have uh, sons or daughters on college campuses, ask them what's going on. It's a serious, serious problem. And we have to give them the support that they need. Related to that, a couple of questions on your opinion of uh, Jewish Voice for Peace. You know, Jewish Voice for Peace sprang out of something called the Jewish Alliance Against Zionism. Uh, the Jewish Voice for Peace is an anti-Zionist organization. Those who deny the validity of Zionism as the national liberation movement of the Jewish people deny Israel's right to exist. Uh, I once sat with Menachem Begin, a Jewish community leader here in Northern California, asked him, can't you do something about that dirty word Zionism? And Begin, who was exhausted, he was tired, the blood rushed to his cheeks, he was all set to go, and he said, Zionism is the scaffolding upon which the Jewish state is created. Uh, I am proudly a Zionist, and I believe that Zionism is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people, and I think we need to be able to embrace that and talk about that openly. Uh, so my, my honest sense is it's our job to convey the issues. And when you run into a Jewish voice for peace, by the way, do you all remember there was once an anti-Zionist group called the American Council for Judaism? It still exists. Uh, and all I can say is I don't believe they represent a majority of American Jews. I do believe 
They are outspoken and they need to be countered uh, by those who disagree with them. I am a Zionist. Uh, I believe that Zionism is the vehicle for political expression given to Jews. Uh, and uh, uh, the Jewish Voice for Peace is an anti-Zionist organization. They're outside of the realm of the Jewish community. And I, I welcome the fact that you've asked the question, and I hope it's answered uh, very clearly and precisely. Yeah. Um, there are so many worthwhile projects to support Israel. Um, and the uh, questioner is asking, um, which uh, one do you feel is an effective overarching organization that could impact? I don't you? make recommendations on organizations. You choose the one you like. Uh, there are many in this country that do very effective work on behalf of Israel. If you believe in, uh, in uh, uh, whatever you believe in, you can find an organization that represents you. Uh, I am completely neutral as long as an organization expresses a pro-Israel position uh, and uh, the Jewish Voice for Peace does not, so I'm critical of them. But as long as you are within the mainstream of the Zionist movement, I was once the president of the Zionist Federation here in Northern California. We had everything from the Americans for Progressive Israel on the left to Cheirut USA on the right. And uh, I welcomed dealing with all of them. Uh, my concern, we, we can fight amongst ourselves. It's a very easy thing to do. But we are now in a world in which Jews better stand together. Because if we don't, we're all going to be victims. Uh, so I, I suggest to you that you should choose the organization that you feel most comfortable with and go with it. There are a couple of questions here related to what you called um, an intel intelligence uh, failure, but some yes. people are seeing more um, either conspiracy uh, theories around it or something more nefarious around the Israel missing this or maybe willfully ignoring signs. Yeah. What's your take? I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Uh, Golda Meir uh, made a choice on the eve of the Yom Kippur War, which she regretted the rest of her life. Uh, she felt she had failed. Uh, in Israel, there will be a lot of second guessing and reassessing. I, I can't go back and correct the past. I'm a historian, as many of you know, uh, and I write books about history. But all you can do is take the moment you're in and move forward with it. I intend to do everything I can to help Israel in its hour of need. And may I say, we as Jews who live outside of Israel have the obligation to do the same thing uh, for ourselves in our own communities. I can't solve the problems of the world, but I can, in my own community, make a difference. And I think that's something we all have to think about. And uh, we'll find, uh, find the vehicles that we think are appropriate. Time check, John. We're an hour in. Uh, I still have many questions for you. Just wanted to make Go sure. right ahead. I have nothing but time. Great. Okay. There's a couple of questions that I'll kind of coalesce. Asking about um, the Palestinian situation and why um, the, uh, the people uh, trying to flee are not uh, allowed to enter Egypt, why they're not supported by the other um, Arab countries around it. Um, the the, the in Ukraine, where um, uh, there was a lot more international help for those yeah. uh, people fleeing the war. The answer is that Hamas is a Islamic extremist organization. Do you all remember what happened when Mubarak was overthrown in Egypt? Uh, and then the Muslim Brotherhood won the election and took over. And the army had to come back and throw that government out. And that's why we have General Sisi, President Sisi today. Uh, the answer is because radical Islam is an infection uh, that many of the so-called moderate Arab leaders are very much afraid of, and they should be afraid of radical Islam. So the last thing Egypt wants is Hamas in their borders, pure and simple. Look at Jordan, King Hussein of Jordan. Do you know what he does with radical extremists? Well, Hussein uh, is gone, but he destroyed them, if you remember Black September. And now his grandson, Abdullah II, does the same thing. Uh, they will not permit that kind of radicalism in their country because it'll destabilize them. So uh, whether you're talking about Egypt or Jordan, and if you have friends in Lebanon, uh, Lebanon, the Christians in Lebanon who form their own society are determined to preserve their own situation as well. Uh, so 
as long as Hamas, which is a radical Islamic organization, uh, which is committed not only to the destruction of Israel, but uh, is an avowed enemy of the United States of America and moderate Arab nations, as long as they have a foothold, the Arab world will reject them. And that's why General Sisi will not admit radical Islamists into Egypt. He's not going to destabilize his country. Uh, and remember, that was what happened when the Muslim Brotherhood won the election. And the army countered because they understood what was happening. You know, it's not a peaceful neighborhood. Do you all understand that? And somebody asked me about Saudi Arabia. Wouldn't it be better if the Saudi family were overthrown? Well, let me tell you, if the Saudi family were overthrown, the name of that peninsula would not be Saudi Arabia. Saudi is the name of a, of a family. It would be the Islamic Republic of Arabia. And if you think we've got trouble now, imagine what it would be if the Saudi family were overthrown. Doesn't mean I love them. They are barbarians. But as I said earlier, they are our barbarians. And let me also reflect with you for a moment on Iran. Uh, I think the world would have been better off if the Shah had been maintained in power. The Shah was a barbarian, but he was our barbarian. And these are hard choices made in real political situations. Let me just quickly answer, answer a question I want to ask myself. What will happen in the next Israeli election? I have no idea. But I can tell you a new generation of leaders is going to emerge in Israel. Uh, and it's fascinating for me when I quote a Golda Meir or a David Ben-Gurion. You know, Ben-Gurion's death uh, was exactly 50 years ago, December 1st. Uh, he was a powerful force in Israel, the creator of the modern state. Most people have never heard of Ben-Gurion. Most people have never heard of Golda Meir. Most people have never heard of Menachem Begin. Uh, they, they just have no awareness of the history of the Middle East. So... Uh, I would, I would suggest to you that the currents that flow in the Middle East are highly complex. And uh, I reflected on that with the passing of Henry Kissinger, a man of great controversy who created the idea of shuttle diplomacy. Kissinger is the one who inaugurated shuttle diplomacy. Uh, and uh, now Anthony Blinken, our Secretary of State, nobody's asked a question about Anthony Blinken. Uh, he's playing that same role. Uh, and that that's part of the role that America plays. Thank God we are in a position to try to help in these situations. The next question. More of a comment uh, from somebody um, who lives in San Francisco saying that they've had the friends uh, had their mezuzah ripped off their door, um, that they've yes. been attacked on Facebook, that they're really afraid of showing outward signs of being Jewish when they leave the house. Um, 100%. We had a... a uh, area two blocks away from me with anti-Semitic graffiti on one of the walls. You're right. That's the insecurity of Jews in America. May I ask who amongst you would ever be afraid because you're a Jew? It's unheard of. And yet I have friends who tell their children, take off your stars of David, take off your yarmulkes, uh, be a little bit more discreet. Well, that's not the kind of Jew I want to be. Uh, those of you who listen to me on the radio, the, almost three decades I was on KGO, I never put my head down because I was a Jew. I wasn't prepared to live in fear. And I'm not prepared to live in fear now. Uh, I'm very proud of who I am. I'm very proud of what I believe. I've never hesitated. Let me just point out to you, uh, some years ago, the J Weekly ran a cover story on, on hate speech on the radio. They interviewed Ron Owens, my colleague Ron Owens, uh, Michael Krasny, who was with KQED for many years, and myself. Oh, look, we received death threats. We, I have the whole nine yards. There are a lot of nuts and coots out there. But the most important single thing is to have faith in yourself and have faith in your community. And I think uh, that's our challenge. And we have to demand from our neighbors their kind of their support. So that's my answer. I, 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 I wish I had a better answer. Do you know what it, what does it mean when you tell a kid, take off your Star of David or take off your yarmulke, don't identify Jewishly? What, what, what kind of life is that? Uh, I had a friend the other day, a, a very distinguished rabbi, who said, what we're going through now reminds him of 1938. 
Well, I'm not prepared to go back to 1938 and the insecurities that we faced. Uh, I've always been proud of the fact that I am a Jew, and uh, we simply have to remember our history and intensify our involvement. Next question. So related to that, there's a few questions about the how. How do you counteract that? How do you tell your colleagues and friends, for example, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space who are silent on the issue, or how do you counteract uh, the um, just Israel genocidal tendencies out there on, on social media? Today? Right. First of all, think of Black Lives Matter. Uh, no one doubted uh, that we had to stand for the rights of African Americans. Well, we have to stand for the rights of Jews in America as well. Uh, I want to be crystal clear about this. Uh, I believe in inclusion and equity and all the rest, but there's no, no doubt about it. Talk about ethnic studies in colleges and universities. Jews are not considered an ethnic group. Well, I have news for you. Uh, what is the definition of civilization? History, language, literature, art form, religion, philosophy, land. Possessing those six key ingredients, you are a civilization. Jews are a civilization. Somebody said, but Jews are white. I have news for you. In Europe, the Nuremberg Laws, Jews were not considered white. They were considered Jews. And I have no hesitation in going to ethnic studies uh, classes or lecturing in those classes or telling my own children when they were in college, always be proud of being a Jew and uh, don't, uh, don't uh, suffer that kind of intolerance and bigotry. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, I don't call it anti-Semitism. I call it Jew hatred. And you're hearing it manifested every single day uh, now in the United States of America. That's why 60 Minutes ran what it ran uh, yesterday. Uh, so my answer is you just have to stand up and, and, and be proud of who you are. And when it comes to... Uh, these kinds of questions, uh, I have no doubt about it. And by the way, let me point out to you, I was instrumental when uh, Jewish studies were finally granted as a part of a, a course that you could major in or minor in at American universities. Uh, Jews have the same right as every other people uh, to understand who they are. Maybe our failure has been that most of our kids aren't functionally trained as Jews. They don't know their history, their language, their literature, their art forms, their religion, philosophy, or their land. They don't know these things. In, in part, it's a self-inflicted wound. By the way, who out there would like your son or daughter to become a Jewish educator, for heaven's sake? I think that goes, or become a rabbi, God forbid. You know, I, 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 I say it with some humor, but we have to uh, be aware of the fact that we have to stand up for ourselves and educate our own community. A couple of questions on the media. What are some uh, sources to keep up with all the events going on in Israel and the U.S.? And then what is your take with uh, particular slants of uh, particular outlets? Okay. First of all, uh, I listen to the CBS hourly news on KCBS, but wherever your CBS network is, it's a five-minute news summary at the top of every hour. It gives you the highlights of the news. No biases, no prejudices. It's very solid. Number two, I read the Times of Israel, which is free online every single day. Times of Israel, constantly updating what's going on. Uh, number three, I recognize the biases in the media. Uh, I suffer from low blood pressure, so I listen to Fox. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I feel vastly stimulated. But I recognize that uh, CNN has its biases as well. And MSNBC, its biases. Uh, we don't have a Walter Cronkite or a Chet Huntley, David Brinkley anymore. Um, and so it's a, it's a serious problem. So I rely on news sources, which I can trust. And when it comes to Israel news, Middle East, I go to the Times of Israel, which, by the way, uh, is free and has wonderful uh, differing views. I very often read things that uh, I don't agree with, which is a good thing. Uh, I listen to everything so I get a sense of where everybody stands. Somebody asked about Jewish Voice for Peace. If I didn't read their books, their materials, their pamphlets, I couldn't say definitively what I've said uh, about them. So uh, that's what I do for, for media. I regret, and I say this absolutely, 
uh, not because I lost my job over it, but I regret there's no more talk radio. You know, at the highlight, uh, the high point, when I was on KGO, I had two to four million people listening to me every single day. At the end, it was about a quarter of a million. But our listening tastes have changed. I do a podcast around the political world with John Rothman. That's my commercial. It's only 10 minutes every day on a leading story in the news. Uh, but I miss the interaction, the give and take, like we're having right now. Go ahead. Next question. Next question related to that as well. The young people. Um, are the ones that uh, are showing a lot more support at rallies for the Palestinian cause. And they're not following the news, they're following TikTok. Um, and there are a lot more unsubstantiated than conspiracy theories there. What can be done about that? The only thing we can do is to use social media as best we can. Uh, I think that's the important thing. I don't have a counter to TikTok and others, except we have to post our own stuff on those. Uh, sites. I, look, I was invited um, about three weeks ago uh, by, it's interesting, it was organized by Chabad in San Francisco. And they brought a hundred people together uh, who were in their 20s and 30s, almost all high-tech people, all college graduates, none of them affiliated particularly with the Jewish community. I had a hundred people there, and they had two speakers. They had a young woman who had been in Israel on October 7th at the uh, music event. And she spoke uh, for maybe 20 minutes. I was in tears the whole time. She was absolutely spectacular. She survived. Many of her friends did not. And then I spoke. And the interesting thing is among that group of people, there was a question, why isn't there more of this? Why aren't there more speakers? Why aren't there more events? And so we have to recognize our own failings uh, as a community. We have to meet their needs. But I'm willing to go social media every day. I do it on, on my own podcast. I have about 30,000 downloads, which is not bad, but it should be many more. And we have to meet people where they are. And so, and I know this uh, discussion is going to be put up online, and I'm delighted. So we, we, we have to reach out. Uh, and there are a lot of new forms, new mediums, which we need to be better acquainted with in order to do it. Now, uh, I know that if I have a problem, my sons are better at getting me on social media than I am. But that's part of what we have to do in terms of a learning curve in our own community. The established organizations are trying, and we hope they succeed, and we're going to help them in every way. Can you talk a bit about the Palestinian civilians? You were talking earlier about um, Egypt and other countries being afraid of um, getting invaded uh, by them. And then there's also still very popular support um, in the uh, Palestinian community for Hamas, just in uh, polls and such. Are all the Palestinian civilians a threat as well? Look, support for Hamas is going to grow. Hamas got some of the prisoners released from prison. They've struck back against Israel which is viewed as the enemy. There's an old expression, hatred is sacred. And hatred of Israel and of Jews is growing. Uh, I don't know how you counter that. I mean, we tried. I want to remind you again, Israel withdrew completely from Gaza, withdrew every settlement, every settler. Um, offered to do everything they could to help Gaza develop its port and its airport and all the rest. I have to tell you a story, and it's a, the saddest story I can ever tell. I, When I travel abroad, I like to visit prisons, because when you visit a prison, you really see the best and the worst of the way people are treated. And I was in Israel some years ago when the uh, fires, the forest fires in the north took place, ignited by radical Palestinians. And I went to an Israeli prison, and I said to the warden, I would like to meet uh, somebody who lit one of the fires. And it was arranged. He was a very nice young fellow. He'd gone to the University of Michigan Ann Arbor campus. He spoke English as well as anybody, uh, completely fluent in American culture. And I, I said to him, I have to ask you a question. I said, look, 
You love this land. You may call it Palestine. I may call it Israel, but we both love the land. And my question is, why would you burn down the trees? The trees are not political. And he looked at me and he gave me an answer that absolutely sent chills up and down my spine. He said, I would rather see the land in ashes than rebuilt by you Jews. How do you respond rationally to a statement like that? How do you respond rationally when at a city council meeting, people refuse, as they did in Oakland, to condemn Hamas for the horrific actions of October 7th? Uh, I can't explain it. I can't rationalize it. But I can fight back in the only way I know how, which is to support Israel, uh, to respond in public forums, uh, to do all that I can to encourage younger Jews to be positive about who they are. Uh, but hatred is sacred among Hamas. You don't believe me? Google the Hamas covenant. It quotes the protocols of the elders of Zion, the most vicious anti-Semitic forgery. Read it. I have a book upstairs about Hamas, uh, written by two non-Jewish scholars about Hamas. Or I interviewed a fellow who, the book on Hamas was published by the uh, Palestinians in, in, in Beirut. And uh, his name is Kharoub. I've interviewed him several times on the air. He's a Palestinian. He has no use for Hamas. He says they will destroy us. So how do you respond when you run into someone who said, I, I'd rather see the land in ashes than rebuilt by you Jews? He didn't even say Israelis. Do you understand? Uh, you can't give in to hate. That, that's all I can tell you. Next question. So if a two-state solution is unimaginable, what does a one-state solution look like going forward? All right, let, let, let's be clear. A two-state solution is imaginable, but you need someone to tango with. You need to have a partner who really means it. I want to point out emphatically that the Palestinian Authority has not condemned Hamas, that Mahmoud Abbas has made no statement condemning Hamas. A one-state solution doesn't work. It can't work because what you have are two people with national identities who need vehicles for expression. It is my sincere hope that the Palestinians will find a vehicle for that expression. If Arik Sharon's dream of Gaza being self-sufficient, independent as a first step had taken place, the polls in Israel are very clear. They show the Israeli people were willing to extend themselves in almost every way, including a two-state solution, if there was a partner. But I like to point out the Middle East is not the Middle West. There are not vast expanses of land. And I think that is a critical equation. I have to tell you, I had an hour-long discussion with my son last night. He's actually... Uh, in Guadalajara, learning Spanish at the moment. Uh, but we spent an hour, and he talked to me. We talked about all the possible solutions. And I came to the conclusion there is no solution. Uh, you have a conflict that grows daily. And although Israel wants to defeat Hamas militarily, may I be blunt and say you cannot defeat the ideology militarily. Uh, I don't know what the world will be like in 10 years or 20 years, but I've never forgotten an experience I had years ago. It was 1968. It was my first trip to Israel. And the Israelis had an exhibit set up in Tel Aviv based on the textbooks that had been used in Gaza and in the West Bank and it showed equations. You know, if you have 10 Jews and you kill eight, how many 
how many Jews are left. Got it? Those are the kind of math problems. Uh, the stories were horrific. I still have the pamphlet. It's titled Hatred is Sacred. I took it home with me back in 68. Once you teach people to hate, what can you do? Now, some would suggest when Germany was defeated in the war, they went. we went through denazification, uh, where training classes were set up and reorientation took place. But this is a whole different society. It's not society as Germany was, based on, on Western values, however distorted the Nazi values were. You're talking about radical Islam here. Look, may I tell you a very personal story? Do you mind if I do this one more time? I'm not a rabbi, but I was considered to be a fairly knowledgeable Jew. And I was in charge of all of secondary Jewish education in Los Angeles. And I got together with uh, George Gross, who was a Presbyterian minister, and Musan al-Biali, who is the imam of Southern California. And we dialogued on three subjects, monotheism and revelation in our three phase, the sanctity of human life in light of contemporary violence, and the contribution of our three phase to civilization. And we took the show on the road. It was a show. We, we traveled to college and university campuses and community centers, and uh, we had a wonderful time. When the Munich massacre took place, 1972, I turned to Musin, who was the Imam of Southern California, and I said to Musin, can you condemn this? Here we are talking about sanctity of human life in light of contemporary violence. And I want you to know, Musin al-Biali was the only Islamic leader in the world to condemn what happened in Munich. And he paid a severe penalty. He was visiting in Cairo and he was killed. In a way, I've always blamed myself for having convinced him to take a stand, which I know he believed in. When you have that kind of extremism, when you have that kind of a leading Islamic leader willing to do the moderate, the right thing to condemn violence, being killed because he took that stand. It was very discouraging, but it didn't bother me. I went on the board of interns for peace, which was a group of Israelis working in Arab communities. I helped Lee Gordon create a program called Hand in Hand, where Arab and Jewish children go to schools together. Um, I worked with the Frankel Center in Haifa uh, to work with children with disabilities, Arab and Jew. I refuse to give up the dream, but I'm also the ultimate pragmatist. Uh, you can dialogue, you can talk, but how do you eliminate the hate that exists? And I must tell you, uh, that was Golda Meir's point. You know, we can forgive them for killing our children, but how do we forgive them for making us kill theirs? I want you all to think about that. And, and that's the conundrum in Israel today. Do you think Israelis rejoice? Wait a minute, all of you gather around your Passover Seder, at Pesach, you, you sit, and you know the story that we are told that we should not rejoice at the death of the Egyptians. And indeed, do you remember the rest of the story? The angels in heaven are dancing and rejoicing, and God stops them. How can you rejoice at the death of any of my children? And I think that's an important ethical lesson for us. But I can assure you, I support fully Israel's desire for self-defense. What happened on October 7th changed forever, I hope, the way we as Jews view the world and the way the world views us. I am not prepared to be a victim. I'm not prepared to be a victim. And I think that is a very important element that Israel has given us. As I quoted Eric Hoffer earlier, the problem with the world is they expect Jews to be the only real Christians in the world. 
We're not going to turn the other cheek. We can't. Next question. Several questions concerning population transfers. We've seen Azerbaijanis do it to Armenians lately. There's uh, was a Times article about um, the Af Afghanis uh, who've been in uh, Pakistan being moved back to Afghanistan. And right. um, there's also the Ukrainians um, being pushed um, out of Russia and getting relocated. What is your thought about even possibilities around um, population transfers in Israel to uh, solve the problem? Okay. Let me tell you, population transfer was very popular in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, the British Labour Party, in its platform in 1945, advocated a population transfer, Arabs and Jews. Uh, Herbert Hoover, uh, the former president of the United States in the 1930s, supported a population transfer as well. I have a whole book of all the proposals of population transfer. Uh, India, Pakistan is, of course, the great example of that. But it doesn't work. Uh, somehow, we have to come to the realization Palestinians have rights. But I want to be crystal clear. If you remember nothing else that I say tonight, Palestinians have rights, but not at the expense of Israel's right to exist. So population transfer, in, in theory, I guess makes sense. Look, I'll give you another one. How about the idea that Jordan is Palestine? You know, 80% uh, of the population of Jordan are Palestinian. They have 80% of the land of pre-mandated Palestine. Uh, the argument can be made. You know, at one point, the Yasser Arafat and his people wanted to overthrow King Hussein. That's what Black September was in 1970, to create a Palestinian state. And uh, Israel interfered to help Hussein because uh, they felt they could make a better deal with King Hussein than they could with the radical Palestinians. But that's all history now. Uh, so you have to be very pragmatic, very realistic in all of this. And Palestinians have rights, but not at the expense of Israel's right to exist. Next couple of questions. Any thoughts around how the Israeli military is uh, performing uh, on the southern border in terms of are they being too careful? How much um, time do they have before a ceasefire? Basically? I don't know. I, I have to answer that with an I don't know. I just don't. Uh, I think my friends in the military tell me, and I speak with them fairly regularly, they're doing the best they can in a very tough situation. There is one thing that they have made clear. They will not go back to what existed prior to October 7th. The communities in the South will not be made vulnerable. And even tonight, the air raid sirens were going off in Tel Aviv. I want to remind everybody what I said earlier, and I know I've said a lot tonight, you might forget a lot of stuff, but remember this. When you listen to the commentaries from the Palestinians, they talk about an occupation that is now 75 years old. Israel is not occupying anything when it comes to its right to exist. And the statements like that deny Israel's right to exist. So I don't know what the military outcome will be. I, I, I can only tell you, uh, I have friends who are serving in the army now who are very depressed. Uh, they want to fight for their country, and they will fight for their country, but they ask, what does this mean for the future? Uh, I wish I had an answer. I wish I had an answer. You know what I believed? I always believed that once Israel was firmly established, ultimately it would be accepted. Okay? Egypt ultimately made a deal. If you'd asked me who would come first to Jerusalem, the Mashiach or Anwar Sadat, I would have put my money on the Mashiach. Why did Sadat come to Jerusalem? Because he understood he could not defeat Israel militarily. Couldn't do it. Uh, Israel had and has an atomic weapon, although they don't admit it. And Sadat said, there's no point. We can't destroy them. Hussein ultimately made peace with Israel because without the Israelis, Hussein would have been overthrown years ago. Uh, the Abraham Accords, uh, which are a phenomenal achievement, uh, for economic prosperity in the Middle East. Um, that has to be the hope. Uh, I can tell you one other thing that is an interesting reflection. I first went to Israel in 1968. By the way, on my program, Wolf Blitzer, David Dallin, 
MJ Rosenberg. We had a very distinguished group of people uh, on that trip to Israel. And in those days, you could go anywhere. I would go into Jerusalem any hour of the day or night with no fear at all. We went to Gaza, no fear at all, nothing. And I believed something. It goes to show you how beliefs change. I believed, as did Teddy Kolak, the former mayor of Jerusalem, that if we shopped in the same stores, if we our children played in the same parks, if we went on the same tiluim, the same uh, excursions, if we if we lived together, we would learn to live together, and that some of the bitterness would erode. And I learned that was an illusion. It didn't dissipate. And when the economic prosperity of Palestinians on the West Bank went up and the infant mortality rate went way down, and now look at them. It's a mess. I don't know. I don't know what else Israel could have done. And I say this with all candor. I made the argument when you were in college, just that very point. But you know what I learned? All the statistics in the world don't, don't influence how people feel. And if, as I believe, the Palestinian national movement is still determined to see Israel destroyed, then we have no choice but to continue to defend ourselves. And I say we, because I have the feeling that as Israel goes, so goes the Jewish communities outside of Israel. I believe as Israel goes, so does Western civilization go. I agree completely. And some of you have read my book uh, that I wrote with David Dallin, Icon of Evil, Hitler's Mufti and the Rise of Radical Islam, published by Random House. Uh, we stated, and I took a lot of heat for that. There was a full page review in the New York Times by Tom Seged. And uh, Tom was in those days uh, an Israeli revisionist historian. He blasted our book, not because we were wrong, but because we told the truth. And may I tell you, one of the saddest realizations for me is that what David Dallin and I wrote in that book has proved to be absolutely true. Icon of evil, Hitler's mufti and the rise of radical Islam. Interestingly enough, Alan Dershowitz, who is now a controversial figure, insisted at no fee on writing the introduction to the paperback edition of the book, which was published by Transaction. You can find it online. And uh, it's a sad commentary because I want everyone to be aware Israel did everything within its power. Look, one of the people I had greatest respect for was Menachem Begin. Uh, I brought Menachem Begin to San Francisco in 1975. Begin was tough as nails. And yet he is the one who extended his hand to Anwar Sadat. He's the one who said, we, we have to make compromises. Begin is the one who returned the entire Sinai to Egypt. And Sharon, who was a hardliner, returned Gaza, to Gaza, not, not to Egypt. The Egyptians had controlled it. You cannot say that Israel has not made an effort. But when you have implacable hate directed against you, when you have the kind of atrocities committed on October 7th, what must people think? Think about it. And if you wonder why Israel is responding the way it is, there is an expression. Never again. And another expression in Hebrew, Ein Brera, no alternative. So these, these are the difficult realities of a free, independent Jewish state in a world. And I must tell you, thank God there is an Israel. I can tell you I am freer, I am more outspoken, I am more comfortable because I live in a world within Israel. Sometimes I read a book, usually on Tisha B'Av, on the ninth day of Av. It's a novel by three Newsweek writers called If Israel Lost the War. 
order it, read it, because you understand what the implications would have been. It's it's almost prophetic. It was written in 1969 by three Newsweek writers. The premise was offered by Golda Meir, who said, imagine if the Arabs had hit our air bases first, and they'd been wiped out. You know, Israel only won the Six-Day War because uh, they wiped out the Egyptian Air Force. I mean, it's something to think about. Okay, next. Hmm. Okay, I think uh, we we are towards uh, wrapping it up. I really want to... What? Say. It's <laughs> well, so early. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's Only okay. an hour and 40. Maybe, we'll, uh, and I'm trying to kind of combine some questions uh, together. Sure. Maybe we can I'll try to be briefer on, in my answers. On more of an optimistic note on, on, on this, do you see any emerging leaders or thought leaders on the Palestinian or general Arab or general worldwide stage uh, that we can look to um, for the future? I study this question greatly. I try to keep completely current on Palestinian affairs. Um, I don't. I do not see anybody emerging. Some people talk about Barghouti, who is now in an Israeli prison. He's he's horrific. He's, he's as radical as can be. I, I don't see any emerging leadership on the Palestinian side. Maybe as a follow-up, do you see any Israeli Arabs who are uh, able to take that leadership position? No, because from the Palestinian point of view, Israeli Arabs are traitors. Well, I guess no positive note then to end this. No, uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Well, if we're going to end, let me end on a positive note. Uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for having this forum. I hope I've answered as many questions as you have wanted to ask. Uh, I tried to give you off the bark as pragmatic an analysis as I can give you. I am very hopeful about the future. That may surprise you. The resilience of Israel in this crisis has been incredible. The spirit of Israel uh, has been remarkable given all of the vicissitudes uh, and troubles and travails which they have faced. Uh, I have great faith in Israel and its, its future. Uh, these are going to be difficult, complex days. I'm afraid that there will be many more bumps in the road. I think a lot of what happens is going to be extremely difficult. But we must be prepared uh, to speak out, uh, to uh, forcefully articulate Israel's positions to understand that we are blessed to live in a world within Israel. Uh, I believe that with all of my power. And so I especially, and I want to acknowledge Rita Gambert, who invited me to be with you tonight, and, uh, and all of you, I'm very happy to return to your congregation, if only by, uh, by Zoom. And I am delighted and I'm happy to return anytime and may we all hope, speedily and in our time, that there will be a, a better outcome. Thank you, John. This was so informative and comforting. Appreciate you coming to us and speaking. My pleasure. You. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Um, I want to let people know that I'm posting the link for the YouTube, which was live stream, but will also be a recording. I'll also email out that link to everyone who registered in case anyone, um, you know, wasn't able to sit uh, on here. Thank you, Alon, for managing the questions. You Alon, it's nice job. to see you. Believe me. You as well. Thank you, John. And maybe if I'm allowed one plug, we are going to have a congregational um, group setting a discussion forum in which we can talk about our feelings about what is going on and share in person. This will come up in about a week's time. So look for that in the once around. Yes. Excellent. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, John. Thank you to our partners at CCJCC, including Reba. Good night, everyone. Take care. <laughs>